Hey everyone, Dorian Cruncher here. Welcome to the first Nier Blockheads Bootcamp video series. In this series, I'll show you everything you need to know to get a head start on developing applications on the Nier platform. So in this first set of videos, we'll be going over all the fundamentals in regards to the Nier platform and the Nier blockchain. Going over things like what are Nier tokens, how to develop smart contracts in the Nier environment, and just overall how the Nier platform works. We'll be doing all this while working through examples to kind of help you solidify these concepts, all leading up to a project at the end, which will nicely tie up everything together for you. It's said and done, I'm really excited. I hope you are too. So I say we jump in and get started. So if you've seen any of my videos before, you will see that I've come to this page rather frequently. So I want you guys to go to wallet.testnet.near.org and create an account. Then they'll give you an option um, or a list of options. Once you do phone recovery, you're gonna get a verification code. Okay, so there we go, we've actually created our account. But I mean, what is this for? Like, what? why do we need this? The wallet allows you to make contract calls to the blockchain, set up your local node, send and receive funds to other users, and the wallet also acts like your account to um, two third-party applications made on the near platform. So you can actually use this to log in to your account. So I know the term wallet is kind of weird. I found this ID in this wallet. And if that's the case, this must be your wallet. That makes sense to me. Then take it. It's not my wallet. Oh, you dimp, I'll take back your wallet and I'll rip you up. So when you take like take the term wallet and kind of like change your definition of it, it's like it's essentially like your key to um, different blockchain platforms. In this case, it's the key to our near um, blockchain platform, allowing us to send tokens, log into third-party applications, and just do much, much more. This is how you create your wallet. So I know we went over a lot of terms, so I thought it'd be a good idea to summarize them up into a nice little cheat sheet for you guys. So the first term is wallet, which is just essentially your blockchain account. It's not to be confused with a conventional wallet. It's not my wallet! That you might think of just like holding your credit card to money. Uh, it actually, it does that, but it does a lot more. So on the near platform, the wallet does manage your cryptocurrency like you might think it would. It also manages your access keys and it can even be used as the account that you would use to log into your third party applications. So you can actually use it as your means of logging in and logging out and managing all your applications. Kind of like the way that Facebook looks, lets you log in or log out onto a slew of third party applications across the internet. So, you know, when it says want to log into your Facebook, it's kind of the same thing with the near wallet account on cryptocurrency accounts created on the near blockchain. So uh, it's a little more than just your conventional wallet. Um, NFT, which is non-fungible token, is just any unique asset that is recorded on a blockchain. So think of a personally signed baseball card or kind of like a serial number that you might find on some item. Uh, this can be digital or physical. And even though it has the, t the uh, word token in the name, this is not a form of cryptocurrency. I want to be clear about that. Uh, it is, just means a unique item or asset. So again, because it, you know we have near tokens, we're working in the near environment, so you hear near tokens a lot. Uh, a non-fungible token is not cryptocurrency like a near token is. It just means a unique item or asset. So think of the uh, CryptoKitty examples I mentioned earlier. Smart contract is next, is a unique, is a set of instructions that executes when some conditions have been met. On the near platform that is written in TypeScript or Rust. Uh, next up is blockchain. This is the super short, simplified version. This is obviously a little more involved, but uh, the short version is as a linked list that, is on, that exists on a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network in which validators must agree to initial, an additional block being added onto the blockchain. So. Uh, that last little bit of the uh, validators agreeing to add an additional block onto a blockchain, that is called proof of stake. That's a short version of what a proof of stake is. The other version is proof of work, which is essentially what Bitcoin runs on when you're trying to mine something. Uh, but for now, on the near network, we utilize the uh, proof of stake method. So next up, you have gas. Uh, gas is the uh, fees calculated by the cost of computation for each addition, for each addition to the blockchain or to the network. Um, so a gas does incur fees, meaning that like to say add information onto the blockchain, you have to pay some sort of fee to a validator and that fee is calculated by the cost of gas. Uh, near tokens is essentially just cryptocurrency. 
New Tokens is cryptocurrency that exists on the Near blockchain. Um, so here's your cheat sheet. Uh, take a screenshot, download it, I'll make it available for you guys if you want. And yeah, let's move on. So let me give you an overview of what's actually happening here. So here you have your account name, your total balance, the minimum balance needed to keep your account open and your available balance. If you ever need to go back to um, any of these definitions, you can hover your mouse over the little eyes here, little information buttons here. Again, this is your account page. You can navigate to here by clicking on profile. The data on this account is actually is stored and accessible on the um, near blockchain, meaning it's on, um, there's no central server that's actually holding this information for you. So it's on a distributed node a distributed network of nodes. So that's actually pretty cool. You can request tokens from other account holders. Uh, so you can give them this information to then have them send tokens to you. Here's a window you can use to send tokens to other near account holders. I'm gonna send, uh, let's just send like two tokens to blockheads.testnet. Confirm and send. And these are just test tokens. Again, I'll go into tokens a little bit later. So go to dashboard. And you can get to this dashboard by hitting on the summary button. Um, so you can see that like I've actually sent and transferred two new tokens to blockheads.testnet. It's been recorded and added to the blockchain. You can get a more detailed view of the transaction here. Uh, remember, so that so that your wallet is essentially your account manager. It's, again, it's not like a normal wallet. So when you kind of like make that dissociation in your mind when it comes to blockchain applications. Um, so if I go over to authorized applications, you can actually use the wallet here to manage um, applications you have authorized to um, use and access your account. So you have two different levels of access, um, like a function call access and a full access. Here in this other window, you can see the accounts that you've given full access to, meaning that like these third-party applications can actually send near tokens on your behalf. So you want to be mindful of um, what you give full access to in terms of the accounts. If you see that you have a third-party application you no longer want to give access to, you can actually hit this button and hit deauthorize. Uh, this will all make sense once we actually make our own application, our own third-party applications, and sync them to our near wallet. The final thing I want to show you before I move on is if you hit on the um, help button, you're going to launch to the near Discord, or you get like a Discord invitation link. So if you don't have a Discord account, I encourage you guys to make one so you can get plugged in with the Nier community. So now we have the wallet out of the way, I think it's time to jump into the development tools that Nier has created to make it easier for you guys to develop your blockchain applications. So with that, I say we jump into Create Nier App. And create Nier App is a, is a tool that will give you a head start on developing your blockchain application, just like Create React App is a tool that will like essentially give you a setup. It sets up your network configuration settings. So uh, essentially you can think of like mainnet versus testnet, which is essentially the two different networks that the blockchain is being hosted on. Mostly functioning in testnet for this project in this course. Your app configuration settings, so connected to your wallet, give you um, some really cool functions to log in and log out, and just kind of like set you up with the basics you need to at least run your application. Um, it'll set you up to write your contracts and assembly script to Rust, we'll go to more of what each of those are later. And it'll even give you, like I said, an example application so you can kind of see how everything's wired up. And like you can even use some of those like functions that are already built into the application in your main app. So when you head over to Node.js's website and download the LTS version, the one that's recommended for most users, it tends to be more stable than this other one. I would recommend downloading via um, Visual Studio Code. Um, this is my preferred text editor, and this is the one I'll be using for the examples in this workshop. Um, but you can use your own preferred text editor if, you, if you'd like, but I do recommend downloading this. So when you open up VS Code and then type in npx create near app and give it a name. So let's give it the name example one. Cool, and there we go. Upon running this application, you're gonna see um, your example one folder appear here. So you can navigate into it by, by typing CD within the name of your project folder. Go into source, um, you can see all these files here. Uh, this is all just vanilla JS, no framework involved. Um, but we will include a framework in a minute. 
but right now we have index.html um, in index.js and what this is actually creating this is actually creating an example application so you can actually open and check out that example application by typing in yarn dev nature is amazing okay there we go so it's running at localhost 1234 so you have um, this example application what it does is you can change your greeting to your own little app your own um, name so I'm logged in currently as blockheads.testnet it's just kind of stayed logged in after I recreated the wallet create our wallet account um, so you just change the greeting, hit save, and it changes this hello to something else and saves it on the blockchain, which is kind of cool. Uh, gives you some cool notes about um, where, with some, where things are located in the create near app. So you can find your contract calls. Your, um, you can, it tells you like how to start and how to initiate your, um, your scripts that come with a create near app. But we can go over this in a minute. So I want to head back over into create near app, kind of give you an overview of what's happening here. So first thing I want you to do is go over to utils.js. This is kind of the central connecting hub for a lot of this application. So um, a lot of these functions that you see here, uh, such as uh, you know near config, get config, like all these um, all these like kind of like unique app, unique variables that are here, are coming from the uh, near API JS um, package. So you have connect, contract, key stores, and wallet connection. We'll be working with these and adding even more to these later on. Um, I'll drop the GitHub link in the description below to the near API.js as well as some near documentation for you all. Uh, so what's cool about create near app is that it sets up a lot of the stuff for you like as earlier as mentioned earlier. So you can go into your config folder to see the information of each of the different networks that the configuration folder is connecting you to as a user. Um, again, we're working in the testnet, so luckily, lucky for us, the testnet is the default um, case for the configuration. Headed back to utils, you're going to see over here we have these two things called view methods and change methods. These are actually um, how you make and how you make contract calls to your custom contract functions. Um, before we move on with what these actually mean, I'm going to show you where the contract functions actually are. So go over up to the assembly folder and down to main.ts. So this is written in assembly script, which is a dialect of TypeScript, so it's essentially written in TypeScript. Um, again, more into that a little bit later. Uh, they have two example functions here, the get greeting and set greeting function. I'm um, kind of read these to see what they're more about, but these are just for the applications. So we can just move on from these. Essentially, all you need to know for now is that your contract functions exist in the main.ts folder inside the assembly folder. Go back to utils.js. Any like contract call you, any contract function you create will then be placed as a string into the view methods and change methods uh, arrays here. So the difference between view method and change method is that the view method uh, will return some value or some information that you want to pull from the blockchain for your application, while the change method actually adds or changes the state of the blockchain. So it's important to know that, um, that like distinction. So this is essentially all you need to know for just the, the raw vanilla version of Create Near App. So now I want you guys to hit Command, or I'm sorry, Control C. I'm running on a Mac, but Control C to stop the development server from running. And I want you to navigate back up um, one folder to the near workshop folder or whatever your directory is, but just navigate out of the example one folder we created. So do cd dot dot. Now we're back in our um, directory above it. So now I want you to type in uh, create, I'm sorry, npx create near app dash dash front end is equal to double colon, I'm sorry, I'll colon. <laughs> Uh, React, and then name of application, which we're going to call example2. So let's just call this um, example2. That makes sense to me. So we can go into example2. Uh, we'll first navigate into it. So type in cd example2. Um, you can run yarn dev again. Just refresh your page, you should see the exact same application. Oh, nope, you type it up here. <laughs> That's good. 
So uh, it's the same example um, that we had before. Um, the only difference is that this is structured for React. So you can go into your source folder. You can see you have your app.js file here. In your index.js file, it's just referencing this app, um, this app JS file here as a component. So just a normal, just the normal run of the mill React setup. Um, again, this is exactly what we're gonna be mostly using for application. Um, and everything other than the, you know, the initial setup of like going from index.js to um, your app.js is the same. So we go to utils.js, we find the same uh, functions we saw before. We see the same login and logout features, the same um, v method and change method arrays, config, and then your API.js um, library. We go into assembly and go to main.ts, and this is exactly the same. So essentially, um, the setup is exactly the same, but the front end um, and all the packages installed include React so you can develop in the React environment. Now let's enter into the world of near CLI. I know that terminal like stuff sometimes seems pretty scary, but it also gives you a lot of control, a lot of like ease of access to um, be able to control the near API. So what is the near CLI? So the near CLI um, is a fully featured Node.js command line interface that acts as a wrapper for the near API.js. So it gives you full control and full direct control of the near API.js wrapped up neatly into some nice uh, terminal commands. So with that, you can create accounts, delete accounts, log into an account, view public keys, view um, account state, which is like the metadata for your account, and then send your tokens and also stake tokens, and honestly, much more past that. So why should you know about it? So again, it allows for direct control over the near API, uh, provides a better, better understanding of like how to create near app works, create you know, by creating dev accounts and deploying contracts, uh, which is another thing you can do with the near CLI. And this will also allow you to write your own scripts in the uh, package.json file for development as well as like in the uh, bash terminal. So yeah, I mean, this is a very powerful tool and I definitely recommend people like learning it. So now that you have your environment installed, I want you to head over to your terminal and we can go through some basic examples of what you can do with the near CLI. So first thing we you do is type in near login. It's gonna spit you out to the uh, near wallet so, okay. so it should spit you out to this page to the near wallet. I'm requesting full access to your account. So what full access means is the near CLI to deploy and redeploy contracts on your account's behalf, uh, send near tokens and allow you um, full control over your account and your access keys. So you're gonna be um, careful with what you allow full access to, but um, with the near CLI, that's kind of what you want. You want full access, full control of your account. So type allow, or click allow and retype your name, so blockheads.testnet. So you get to this window, I'm letting you know you're logged in, so you can, close, you can go ahead and close this window. Head back to your near terminal, and here's some cool things you can do with, your, um, with the uh, near CLI. So you can type in near state, and type in blockheads.testnet, and you get your account information, so the amount um, of near tokens you have um, in Yocto near the locked tokens, the code hash. Right now, these are all ones because I have no contract deployed to blockheads.testnet. Um, storage usage, storage paid at, the current block height of the blockchain, the current block hash of that block, and then the formatted amount of your near tokens. So this is Yocto near, and this is just um, your near tokens in near. So again, unit of measure is Yocto near for this one, which is why it's so big like 10 to the 24th and then like the uh, you have your format amount which is your normal count for your near tokens with the near CLI you can also get information on the keys paired with an account so it's type in near keys blockheads dot test net You can see all the keys that I have um, paired with this account. So all the oops, so all of these um so all these function call keys you see here are like limited access keys that only allow for non you know financial um, transactions or contract um, calls. Uh, and you can also see the accounts that the contracts um, are de are deployed on. So this is the account that this contract has been deployed on 
that I'm allowing this function call key to interact with. There are also full access keys for, um, se for several other contracts uh, that allow actual um, financial or in the words like cryptocurrency exchange with my account or with blockheads.testnet. Yeah, you can see all this information here. So remember that we have full access to our new account so um, with the new CLI after we logged in. So I can actually use this to send tokens from one account to the next. So I can say near send block heads dot testnet, which is the sender account, to the receiver account, which will be block shop dot testnet, an account I created for an application I made in one of my other videos. I'm going to send them two near tokens. So then you get the transaction ID and a link leading to the near explorer. So I'm going to copy over this link, move into my browser, paste it right in. And here you see the near explorer. You can see the transaction fee, the deposit value, the gas used for this transaction, the, and the date occurred, as well as the hash and some other cool information. So you can actually see that the transaction has been recorded on the near blockchain. Alive, it's alive, it's alive. So now I think would be a good time to take a high level look at smart contracts because you're gonna hear about the this phrase a lot or this idea of smart contracts a lot when you're with blockchain applications. So a smart contract is essentially a file that consists of lines of code that execute once some predetermined conditions have been met and that's really it, that's all they do. So again, it's just code that executes once some predetermined conditions have been met. Moving on, so a smart contract compiles down to WebAssembly. So the near smart contracts are written in an assembly script, um, which is a dialect of TypeScript, which is a lot like JavaScript, does a lot of scripting, <laughs> and Rust. You use assembly script for essentially like non uh, financial exchanges and you would use more like Rust, which is a systems level language to write contract for actual like financial transactions. Um, so both of these will compile down to a .wasm file. And first, what is WebAssembly, right? So WebAssembly is a new low level bytecode format for the web stack based virtual machine. So essentially it takes your code and compiles it down to low level binary, which is supported by all modern browsers to perform, which is also very high performance. So it's a very efficient language. It's pretty new and it's actually pretty exciting and commonly used in the blockchain um, world for mining, gaming, and whatnot. So what is a code hash, right? So in the CLI examples, I showed you guys how to show the state of your account. So you can see your amount, the lock, and then you get to this thing called a code hash. So a code hash is created using the SHA-256 cryptographic hash algorithm. Didn't I tell you I was actually born on a SHA-256 cryptographic hash algorithm? Um, so essentially this is a unique signature generated from that dot .wasm file that I mentioned earlier that your contract gets compiled down to. Um, so your dot .wasm file gets thrown into this hashing algorithm and then spits this out. Um, so why should you care about this is that this will allow you to verify that the correct contract is being used for the transaction you're conducting. Um, just a quick note, remember that hashing is different than encoding. So with encoding, you can encoding is typically reversible. So you can encode something, take that encoded version, and if you know what the encoding algorithm was, you can you know, theoretically just like work backwards. With hashing, you can't. It's a one-way stream, meaning like you have to have the original file to know where this hash came from. You can't go backwards. So that's like hashing is so secure. So um, this is what a code hash looks like when an account has no um, contract deployed on it. So each contract needs a place on the blockchain to live. So it gets deployed to an account. So it lives in an account. So whenever you deploy your um, create near app, or if you run yarn dev and it, take, it takes your contract, creates a dev account for it, which is just like any other account that has its own amount, it has its own storage, it has its own gas, um, and then it'll like give that contract a place to live in that account. So even the accounts you make in your near wallet, like mine, like blockheads.testnet, I could deploy a contract to that. But right now my blockheads.testnet does not have any contract deployed to it, so it's just a string of ones. So now this is what an account looks like when it has a contract deployed onto it. Ooh, 
ignore that little clip there. <laughs> um, so you can see that uh, this dev account, which is a, essentially like a temporary account that's been made um, to host this contract. So again, this account has its own amount near, has it has option for locked tokens. And here's the code hash. You can see that this is actually populated with some contract. Um, so yeah, and it has all the other information and the format account because you actually do need tokens to run these um, dev accounts even. But yeah, that's essentially what it looks like when, when one's populated. So again, let's go through an example of like why this is important to know, like why this is a good thing to keep in mind, this thing meaning the code hash or the code ID. So let's just say you purchase an item, in this example, you purchase an item from an online store. Uh, and the original contract that the application or the store was made, was built on top of, um, let's just say it has the account name, the store being that, the store has the account name blockshop.testnet. This is the receiving account for the uh, near tokens that you wanna send the store for your items. U.testnet, meaning you, the user, will host the account that is receiving the items that you want to buy. Some hacker bro 23 manages to somehow replace the contract in the governing application and switches out your name for his own. So then like you pay the money, but then he will receive the items. Uh, once the transaction begins, meaning once you hit that like send money button, hacker bro 23, um, you, uh, Hacker Bro 23 will see that the transaction will fail because his new contract that gets compiled to a .wasm file will get compiled to a new hash. Sorry, will get will generate some different hash that it's like that's not that's not the hash that's not the original hash of the original contract, right? So you have some code or some logic that can verify the original contract's hash. So the transaction does not execute and it fails. So he does not get your items. So that's a cool thing about knowing about these um, these like code IDs or like these hashes because then you can add this like level of security into your application to prevent someone from like switching out contracts on you on like big important uh, transactions. So in the new CLI section, I touched on the idea of full access and function call keys. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into that so you, make, so you have a full understanding of the difference between two. So full access key allows the application to act on the account's behalf, meaning that this application can now send near tokens or deploy new contracts onto that account. Typically, if you're working with an application that, of course, that works with the near wallet um, as like a means to log in or log out, uh, you will see this window here to your left if the account is requesting full access. Uh, whereas in the function call key, or whereas for the function call key, um, it provides only limited access to the account, uh, enables sending only non-monetary function call transactions from the owner's account to the receiver, and allows a new user to use your contract on chain without having to have an account of their own. So on the right, you, this is this is typically what the wallet will show you when you're logging in to uh, application that's utilizing only a full, or sorry, a function call key. Now you have an idea of what the difference is between a full access key and a function call key. I'm sure you're all wondering, like I was, how the heck do I implement that into my application? How do I how do I request access, full access? to my wallet when I want it, so I can send near tokens, which is a completely fair question. So for this application I have open on screen, this is the application I made called BlockShop, um, which I made in a tutorial for Blockheads, if you're interested in finding that, um, where you have some items here, this like little digital store where you can add items to a cart and purchase these items um, for this many near tokens, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm gonna log in. I immediately see that this is requesting function call access to my account, meaning that I cannot send your tokens with this. So let's log in and see what happens. So I log in, I can see I'm logged in up here. You can see my inventory of items. And let's just say I wanna buy butterfly. So I hit submit. And immediately you see this error appear, 
So it's error saying that this is not this does not have the right correct permissions or correct access key to be able to send um, near tokens off to the blockshop.testnet account. So what's wrong? How you fix this? This looks super complicated and super scary, I'm sure. But let's go into the, into VS Code and see what we can do, what we can alter to change this. So here I'm in utils.js. If you run create near app, this is a file that's automatically created in the create near app. I'm sorry, yeah, create near app uh, boilerplate or say or you know starting template. Um, simply go down to in utils.js to the export function login again utils.js, <laughs> and you will find this um, this line written here. So this is already written. Um, this is already like included in your code, included in the example code that comes with create near app. So all you have to do is like go inside these parentheses and place an empty string as the argument for this function. So this window.wildconnection.request signed function, just place an empty string here. Hit save. Let's go back to our application. You can see everything reloaded. Um, so we're still logged in. So let's log out, log back in. And now you can see this window appear requesting full access to my account. So meaning like this provides access to all of your tokens to so proceed with caution, right? But that's kind of what we want for this exam for this application. Um, again, uh, this is not. Remember, this is foregoing any like levels of security. It's not really like covering any um, like like code ID hashes, you know, hash verification. So, um, but this is just an example application to give you an idea of how to how to grant full access. Um, so I'm going to hit allow. It's going to ask you to verify. So I'm back to my um, to my block shop. See my inventory loaded. Now I'm going to try to buy another butterfly. I'm going to hit submit. Let's wait a minute, and you can see the receipt for that transaction and my new inventory. So if I refresh the page. You can see my count for my butterfly went from five to six. So I gave the shop my near tokens and it gave me my butterfly in return and put it in my inventory. So that's how you actually, um, that's what you do to, set, to uh, change the settings to allow your application to press full access to your near wallet. Here we are at the part where I'm sure you guys are super excited for how you actually go about designing a blockchain application. So I've put, I put together a little starter pack for you guys to kind of go over the use cases of blockchain applications, uh, some design tips, and some structural analogies to compare a blockchain application to a normal application. So how do you actually model a blockchain application? Well, first, I think it's really useful to go over what you can even do with this technology, with blockchain um, tools. So um, some use cases for blockchain applications would be for tracking transactions of any kind. So say you're making a digital store and you're selling um, assets for cryptocurrency. Uh, you can you know, facilitate that exchange of, uh, of goods using crypt uh, smart contracts and blockchain tools. Um, you can also make a decentralized bank to, make, to keep a ledger of every transaction between users. And you, know, you can even exchange information using blockchain applications. That's just one example. Um, ensuring that an item is unique. So this breaks into the world of non-fungible tokens. So uh, I'll go over an example of non-fungible tokens so that I have a mixture sense of what I'm talking about before I super deep dive into a definition. Uh, decentralization. So uh, this is kind of like a high level philosophical idea, but um, philosophical and practical. So instead of like having one core location for your service or your product, um, say like Facebook, everything's kind of like all your data goes to Facebook, and Facebook say has a control over their own um, servers or entities. Uh, blockchain applications exist on a peer-to-peer -peer network, which is a decentralized network, so that this service exists on multiple nodes, multiple computers around the world. It's a decentralized thing, so like it's extremely difficult to break. It's not as fast as a centralized network, but it is is going to last for a long time, and no one necessarily owns the data in this sense. So it's kind of that's kind of super fun, uh, and we can help, we are also going to talk about the world of decentralized games. So here is the example of non-fungible tokens, the thing I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, so if you guys have heard of blockchain, you've most likely heard of CryptoKitties, and if you haven't, you're going to now. So CryptoKitties are a lot like baseball cards. We can do with these CryptoKitties. You can breed them, you can create them, you can make your own little CryptoKitty. Um, and what makes these CryptoKitties special is that they have like different traits that go along with any of them that can be bred into other cats. So these traits, these like specific properties of the cats make them rare. So literally digital cats are rare. And how are they kept rare is that they exist on the Ethereum blockchain. So the code that actually generates these cats are what are what brings its value. So not necessarily this picture, but the code that exists on the blockchain that is that is like that belongs to one single person at a time. So they can trade these just like baseball cards. So here's like a baseball card, and here's this like rare magic card called the Black Lotus. I think it's worth like a hundred thousand dollars or something like that. Something crazy. But its rarity can now be implemented into the digital into the uh, digital space, which I think is kind of fun. Here's something I made recently uh, for the Halloween special of Blockheads. This is the Blocko Lantern application. Uh, this is my version of the implementation of uh, non-fungible tokens. So each of these are custom, unique pumpkins. Uh, their code exists on the blockchain on how they're actually created or developed. And they only belong to one user at a time. So this is the user that owns this particular pumpkin, but they can freely trade or exchange um, this pumpkin with other users. So this is something I created. Um, and let's go over to here. Some more examples I created. So here's a common application, it's a voting app. So I have two candidates here uh, featuring Parks and Rec. Nature is amazing. So you can either vote for one candidate, you can get a description of what they stand for, and like what their platform is. Um, and you know, I thought this was very fitting for voting season. So um, each vote is recorded and kept secure on the blockchain. Uh, you can't change it, you can't go back and undo it. It is there and it's not going anywhere. So that's like an example of like, you know, how like blockchain can be useful for something like voting. Blockchain has even broken its way into the world of gaming. So this is called Zed Run. So these horses are unique. These horses have their own properties. They they're they're raised and bred on like on this uh, on this blockchain network. This actually runs on near on the near blockchain. Um, so a smart contract is put in place to actually exchange money like based off like based off of which horse you bet on. Ideally, it's probably your horse, or I think uh, you can like bet on other people's horses after like watching a game. So the smart contract will facilitate that exchange of money, um, you know, and bets after this race is finished. So these are a few examples. Um, there's so much more. This is literally just like scratching the surface of what we can do with blockchain applications. But here's a few examples of what you can do once you get really good at developing a blockchain application. So how does a blockchain application compare to a normal web app? Well, I'm going to go over some of the key similarities and differences between the two types of applications so you guys can hopefully better understand what's actually happening. For this comparison, I'll be speaking in terms of the near platform, not other blockchain platforms that exist in the blockchain space. For front-end development, both are essentially the same. You're still be using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. You're still able to use some sort of framework on top of that if you'd like, such as React, Vue, or Angular, for both blockchain applications and normal web apps. The backend is where they differ. So the backend for a blockchain application will use a, we utilize assembly script and Rust to develop smart contracts that we need to communicate with the blockchain or the near blockchain to store and retrieve data to and from blockchain. Uh, this is similar to how a normal web app will communicate with a database such as MongoDB by using something like Node or PHP to communicate with the server. Moving on, what is a blockchain? So this is a super short, basic version of what a blockchain is, just to give an idea of what's happening behind the scenes of your application. A much more technical deep dive will be provided in later videos, but this is just to demystify and like kind of move the abstraction of what's actually happening behind your application. Uh, the blockchain is, com is commonly thought of as a linked list, and the linked list is just a chain of nodes uh, that holds some sort of data within each node, such as a reference to the, as well as a reference to the uh, node directly preceding it or succeeding it. Continuing on, the blockchain holds some sort of data and a key. Uh, to access the, this key can be used to access the data within itself, and an additional key is held within the chain to access the key of the preceding block. So every block has a key to access the data within itself, and a hash to access the data within the preceding block. To add a new block to this chain, you have to have a fully verified copy of the blockchain. And different validators on the near platform will, be used, will have to come to an agreement or a consensus that your addition to the blockchain is valid. This process is made less intensive through a process called sharding. 
So like uh, for this stage, you don't really need to know what sharding is, but essentially it's just breaking up the entire blockchain to little sections or chunks so that people don't have to copy the entire thing, but copy a smaller chunk of it is the short and sweet version. So what are things you actually need to know to build a blockchain application? Um, so what you need to know, we need to keep in mind is that you can store and retrieve data on the blockchain. You can use smart contracts to communicate with the blockchain. So smart contracts are your kind of like your bridge to the blockchain to store and retrieve this data. Uh, the blockchain can act as a back end to your database. Not that it always should, uh, but like it can. Uh, the consequences of using your back end as like a place, to, uh, using the blockchain to store exclusive your data is that it can get expensive. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. But for this early stage and for like these like beginner applications you'd make, it's perfectly fine to use the blockchain as a place to store your data. Um, gas is used to run contract calls. Gas, again, is the total computation cost of adding something or changing the state of the blockchain. And gas is paid for by cryptocurrency on the master account. So some use case examples for applications that utilize the blockchain are a voting application, for example, that will store candidate vote counts on the blockchain. So you can see and have a full ledger of everybody who's voted and what they voted for, or can keep it anonymous if you want, depending on how you design your application. A pumpkin drawing app like the one I showed you guys earlier will store the uh, pumpkin drawing instructions as well as the pumpkin ID and transaction records as well as the owner details on the blockchain. So the, all this information is kept, stored, and tracked on the blockchain to ensure that each pumpkin is unique and to ensure who owns pumpkin who has previously owned that pumpkin. A digital store um, can also is a pretty valid and pretty common example that, of something that can like exist on the blockchain. So you have the store that uses smart contracts um, and the blockchain to keep track of transactions and facilitate the exchange of goods on the blockchain. So these are a few basic concepts that will help you develop your application and help you move forward in your process. So here are some prototyping tools that I've used that I found to be helpful with developing my blockchain applications. Miro and Jamboard are both collaborative whiteboard apps. Uh, Balsamic is a web prototyping application, and I even use Google Slides to design some of my web apps. That makes sense to me. To show you some examples, uh, here's Jamboard uh, for designing um, the, or just like brainstorming the pumpkin carving app I showed you guys earlier. Here is Miro. It's something similar, so you can draw shapes. I haven't used this one too frequently, but you know, you can collab with your team to actively draw and create your web application um, to ideate that. And here is Balsamic. So Balsamic has these cool built-in tools to help you design and lay out your web page. So you can make a new browser window by dragging and dropping this here. Type whatever, like blockheads web page. So you can get the title for that web page. You can add buttons, charts, um, some filler text just to get the idea of the layout for your application. And I've even, again, like I said, used a Google Slides to lay out my tiles and get my, give myself an idea of how I want my um, application to go and like what I want this page to actually look like. So what's cool about Google Slides is that they actually do a pretty good job of just having these little alignment features and alignment tools. Um, you can copy and paste these little tiles and add these little stickers or whatever. So, you know, here is my Block of Lantern uh, framework. So these are just a few tools you can use to prototype and ideate and shape out the front end of your application. So great job guys, I know that was a lot of information packed into one video and I wanna thank you guys for sticking with me so far. I think it'd be a good idea to do a quick recap of everything we learned and also give you some next steps moving forward. So um, we went over the near wallet and established that it's not only a place to uh, keep track of your near tokens, but also a place to manage your access keys, send and receive near tokens, and it can act as your um, your user's account uh, login for any blockchain, third-party blockchain applications that you or another developer may make. We also went over some cool, useful tips and tricks you can do with the Near CLI for development, and went over the create near app uh, structure and overview for both vanilla um, JS and React JS. We also took a dive into smart contracts and how they work in general in the blockchain world. Um, and how they function on the, your platform to facilitate your exchanges uh, with or to and from the near blockchain. Uh, and we also kind of took a quick little look over um, TypeScript particularly, but went over the idea of like TypeScript and Rust being used to create these smart contracts. 
I also took a quick overview of cryptography and how it relates to smart contracts. And we also went over some key differences between the full access keys and the function call access keys. And then finally, we went over the differences between um, a normal application versus a blockchain application to see how they're similar and different. Uh, so you can get an idea of like what analogies you can kind of like tie between the two um, to hopefully help you develop your applications a little better moving forward. I also went over some real world blockchain use case examples such as CryptoKitties, uh, the voting app and the pumpkin carving app I showed, I showed you guys, as well as some uh, design and prototyping tools you guys can use. Uh, to get started in creation and development of your own application. Moving forward, I definitely recommend to check out the next section, section two, uh, where we'll be building this application, which I like to call Block View. It'll kind of be a nice tie in together for all the concepts we learned today to uh, go over some of the information that's displayed and provided to you from the near blockchain, um, as well as how to create and structure. Uh, your smart contracts and make smart contract calls and log in and out of your account. It'll nicely type everything we've learned in this first section and hopefully get you guys started on creating your own blockchain applications. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Was there anything I missed? Was there anything I should go deeper into? Or do you have any questions that you want to ask me? Let me know in the comments below and I'll get back to you guys as soon as possible. I want to make more of these videos in the future, so I definitely encourage you guys to give me as much feedback as you can, because that's going to help me make this content better for you all. That makes sense to me. Then take it. It's not my wallet. Go check out section two of this two-part series to learn how to create block view, because that's going to really tie in everything we covered in section one and put you in fighting shape to make some really cool knockout applications in the future. I can't wait to see what you guys create. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Like and subscribe and share with your friends. And with that, have a good day.